Montpelier Roxbury Public School Board is still in session. Mm -hmm. Do we have a quorum? One, four, five, yes. Okay. Yes. Um, the first. May uh, I put two, two additional items on as I noted bet. in the email? Yep. Um, I'd like to add to the agenda the appointment of Paul Giuliani as district moderator, as well as adding the validation resolution um, as an agenda item for the MRPS board, please. Okay. Uh, public comment? Is there any member of the public here who wishes to? Okay. Um, moving on from public comment, the first action item is the approval of the minutes. Um, is there a motion to approve the minutes of February 21st? I'll make a motion to approve, Mr. President. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? The next item is the approval of leave of absence requests, which are in your packet. Yep. Got a second. Actually, just two. Uh, I would say a motion to, uh, right, we need a motion to discuss them, so a motion. To is there a second? Second. second. Any discussion? So what they are. I just have the two. Mm -hmm. so right. For both of them, I think. Mm -hmm. For both? Mm -hmm. Yep. To return the 2019 mm -hmm. year, 1920 year. Maybe we accept the um, request for legal absence. I think it's already been moved. Or, yeah, it's, it's already been discussion. moved. Is there any Aye. further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Anybody else wants to pass those to Brian and Ken? All right, should we do the Giuliani? Please. Yes, that would be great, sure. So uh, since there was no um, actual voting that took place in either municipality around a district moderator, um, it simply needs to be an appointment by this board because it is a position that's required as a standalone single district. <coughs> I've been in touch with Paul Giuliani, who was the moderator um, if you recall, for the initial MRPS organizational meeting, and he is happy to continue in that role. All we would need is a motion from this board to appoint him as moderator and an affirmative vote. A motion to appoint Paul Giuliani as the moderator for the MRPS district? I move we appoint Paul Giuliani as the moderator for the MRPS district. Second. Any discussion? So I'm, I, there were two other positions also. Are those not necessary? They were, were voted. They were voted. People ran and they were voted in. So but he was too. No. no. He wasn't elected. No one was, no one was elected. No one was elected. That's why we're he was wasn't on the. He wasn't on the ballot. Right. Got it. They had, okay. He should have been on the ballot for March, and he wasn't. Thanks. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Mr. Giuliani will be the moderator. Um, and then, uh, Brian, can you talk about this validation sure. resolution? Please? Yes, yes. Um, so the validation resolution is for the board's consideration tonight. The purpose is to put to rest any concern that the 2018 annual meeting warnings weren't published or posted precisely as required by the applicable statutes. There's no indication as such, but this is just a safeguard. Um, essentially, Paul is covering his bases for us, both in terms of his role as well now moderator, but prior to that as city attorney, because currently the way that the Montpelier Ward would um, obtain funding for a bond is through the city, because the city currently is our source of revenue. We draw our money from the city, because currently we're still under the city charter until July 1st when we go off on our own. So in order to dot all the I's and cross all of the T's, the resolution that I sent you um, will cover, if any are discovered, any um, statutory 
um, violations that may have been made in terms of posting the warnings about the bond. To be clear, Tammy Legacy, who is the district clerk who was duly elected, affirmed um, the postings for Roxbury, and John Odom affirmed the postings for Montpelier. So there is no indication that there are any irregularities, but should any arise, this would allow you as a board to say, if they came up, we're still validating that these were posted appropriately, and Paul can begin the process of warning the Vermont Municipal Bond Bank that the affirmative vote took place and that we're going to need $4.9 million to complete the work that was a part of the bond. Do you have the text of, of what I we, do, what we need? yes, I do. Um, I can read it for you. It says, whereas pursuant to 16 VSA 706P parentheses A and 26, 24 VSA 1756, notice of the March 6th 2018 annual meeting of the Montpelier Roxbury School District, here and referred to as the district, was given in part by posting and publishing the warning thereof, along with warnings for the annual meetings of the City of Montpelier and the Roxbury Town School District. And whereas, as provided in 24 VSA 1756, notice of said district meeting was to be published in a newspaper of known circulation in such municipality once a week for three consecutive days on the same day of the week, the last publication not to be less than five nor more than 10 days before such meeting, and whereas the requisites of the statute relating to the publication of the district <coughs> annual meeting warning containing an article of business relating to the proposition of incurring bonded indebtedness not having been complied with because of oversight, inadvertence, or mistake of law or fact, the Board of School Directors desire to avail themselves of the validation provisions of 17 VSA 2662 and 24 VSA 1757. And whereas at the March 6th district annual meeting, the proposition of incurring bonded indebtedness for the purpose of making public school building improvements, Article B, was approved, those voting in favor being 1763 and those voting opposed being 631. Now, therefore, the Board of School Directors hereby finds that notwithstanding the failure to comply with all of the statutory requirements incident to the call, notice, and warning of said district annual meeting, the required length notice of the purpose of said meeting has been had accordingly. Be it resolved that, to the fullest extent permitted by law, the Board of School Directors hereby ratify, confirm, and validate that all action taken by the district at the annual meeting thereof on March 16, 2018. I hereby certify that, certify that the foregoing was approved and adopted by an affirmative vote of at least two-thirds of the members of the Montpelier School Board of School Directors of the Montpelier Roxbury School District at a regular meeting thereof held on March 21st, 2018. And the attestation, attestation will come from the district clerk. Is there a motion that we adopt the resolution as read by the superintendent? I'll make a motion that we accept the resolution as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Any discussion or questions? I do have a question just to clarify, Brian. Not about the resolution itself, but the mm -hmm. process. So Paul, as a district moderator, would be speaking to the bond bank? Or no, district? Paul, as the um, city attorney, is beginning the process. There will have to be, at a subsequent meeting, a transfer of debtedness. Because in order to get the process started, we're doing it under the auspices and procedures of the city charter, which we are still under. But there will be a transfer of that debtedness prior to the incurring of the debtedness on or before July 1st, when the MRPS board becomes a district entity unto itself and will take on that debtedness unto itself. So it's multiple hats is why it seems. Yes, confusing. yes. Any further questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you. Thanks. Great. Um, then the next action item on the agenda is to adopt um, five policies that we had the first reading on um, back in Roxbury in February. And those are the HIPAA uh, policy, the home study students policy, the harassment, hazing, and bullying policy, the nutrition <coughs> and wellness policy, proficiency-based graduation requirements, and travel reimbursement. That's actually six. I think I, just, I was counting one. Yeah, I think that's, that's six. six. Yep. Um, so I think my first question will be, does anyone want to discuss 
any of the policies further tonight? And if so, tell me which ones. Of those six. Of those six, just those six that we talked about. Okay. Um, if, if there's no interest, um, and we did go through these last time, if we're just going to adopt them, if someone could move them one by one, move that we adopt each mm -hmm. policy, that would be great. I move that we adopt the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act Compliance Policy. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. I move that we adopt the Participation of Home Study Students Policy. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? I move that we adopt the prevention of harassment, hazing, and bullying of students policy. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I adopt. I move that we adopt the Federal Child Nutrition Act wellness policy. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I move that we adopt the proficiency-based graduation requirements policy. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? And I move that we adopt the travel reimbursement policy. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Thank you. That's very efficient. All right. Um, the remaining uh, policies on the first reading are policies that we haven't seen before. And I just want to talk about some different categories of them and then figure out what order to address them in. Uh, the in-district elementary school transfer policy um, is coming from a collaboration of the policy committee and the superintendents and was primarily handled by Ryan. So when we talk about that one, I'll ask him to introduce it and walk us through. The next three, the conflict of interest code of conduct and superintendent relationship policies were not really intended to be warned tonight. They were intended for a board discussion for the benefit of the policy committee and kind of getting us ready for next week. Um, so I think we should probably discuss them as a group and Ryan and I can both talk about those and take input. Um, they're definitely not at the wordsmithing stage. They're at the how are folks reacting to these and where are we going so stage. So not, not, you know? not having the first reading tonight then on those? They were warned that way, hurt. all the, you know. Or just hurt. do it as a way to open it up and. Right, yeah. right. But they're, they're in a much more preliminary state in terms of input. Um, are we pulling the grade advancement policy we, because we don't need it right, anymore? Right, because we don't need it anymore. We, I, I should say yeah. we found out from the VSBA that the grade advancement um, mandatory policy is inconsistent with the proficiency-based graduation requirement. Right. And um, as such, is no longer going to be a mandatory policy, so that can be stricken um, as we will not need it going forward. Makes sense. So we're not going to talk about that one tonight. Um, <laughs> substitute teachers and the volunteer and work study students are coming from the superintendents, so we'll ask them to talk to us about those. Mm -hmm. And the fiscal and budget policies, uh, Grant has the business manager, Grant Geisler has asked us to talk about. I was inclined to start with those so that he could go home. Is that? Does that work for works everyone? For works for Grant. <laughs> <laughs> I saw that laugh. Yeah, so, <laughs> since we've started, you know, totally two hours behind. You. Yeah. Um, okay, so hearing no objection, I think we will start with the fiscal management and budget execution, and I'll ask Grant to come up and join us. Do we begin by with a motion on it? No, because it's a first just reading. Read just read it. There's no action tonight. So it's just a first reading, so... <laughs> Grant will walk us through them and explain why we're talking about them. Uh, and people can ask questions, et cetera, et cetera. I believe there were um, similar policies prior to the decision by the um, Montpelier Public School Board to adopt the policy governance. That and was so my when first that question. that happened, these came out of policy. Um, so we don't have these in MPS. We don't these have them as new. policies. Um, they kind of ended up by default becoming procedures since they weren't part of the policies under policy governance. Um, my issue is as we start going through audits, um, AOE um, visits for things like fiscal monitoring, special education uh, reviews, 
they are expecting to see many of the items that are within these policies as policies, not as procedures. Um, we just went through and are still going through a special education um, audit. And these were presented to the AOE. Um, you'll see that they don't say on them policy. They just have the designation and the title. Mm -hmm. So um, kind of in a don't ask, don't tell, we provided these. They weren't, I wasn't asked if they were officially policies or not. Um, I believe the assumption from them was that they were policies. They were reviewed, and we did not have any findings on these. So I, the assumption was that they were kind of policies, but if asked, I would have to admit that they are not actually at policies because the board hadn't approved them yet. Um, so I want to just clean that up, make sure these are identified as board approved policies so that we're set for any AOE reviews or, um, and, and our, actually our auditor would be expecting to see these things uh, captured as, as policies. These, I've basically taken, taken perhaps 10 or 15 different policies and just wrapped them into these two documents so that there's only two policies that we're looking at. Um, just for the sake of simplicity, so that you're not hunting and searching for different aspects of these. Fiscal management talks with, uh, talks about uh, fiscal accounting and reporting, things that are statutory requirements of the board. Um, and just some of the procedures like year-end procedures, um, not procedures, but um, activities. Um, talks about fund balance, auditing, student activities, setting up student activities, those kinds of things, and um, capitalizing assets. The budget execution is basically what it says. Um, it's any kind of requirements related to executing our budgets each year. And so that talks about things like bids and purchasing, um, requisitions, purchase orders, reimbursements, grants, gifts, and donations. So I think in these two, we've tried to wrap up everything that relates to business office activities and statutory requirements. Um, a big piece of these documents has to do with federal fiscal um, requirements, um, federal procurement requirements that are federal and state related. So I could go through these with you, or I could just allow you to, to read through them when, when you uh, would like. Um, I'm not sure what else you would like to talk about at Can, this point. Um, did these, so these don't exist as a, like Vermont Association of School Board sample policies. You've, mm -hmm. you've crafted these based on what MPS used to have. You were using uh, based on what MPS used to have, what I had in Essex Westford, um, what some of my colleagues have. Um, in some cases, they, there are separate policies for each of these headings. Um, like fiscal accounting and reporting might be a policy. And, and so what I did was I tried to put fiscal management topics together in one policy and budget execution together in one policy and just cover it in two policies. Um, so a lot of this is, is language that was similar to what we are kind of showing as procedures, although that doesn't really make sense because we have procedures under these. So you have procedures associated with procedures, which doesn't make sense. Whereas if these are adopted as policies, then it does make sense to have procedures under these. Um, so VSBA has these kinds of topics covered as recommended, not mandatory. Um, but a lot of this talks about statutory requirements that the board has for fiscal management um, under 16 VSA 563, I think it is. Um, so I, I think it makes sense for these to be captured as policies. Questions? Uh, first of all, thank you for doing the work on this. This <clears throat> is, uh, I think, the appropriate place for this. And I was thinking about, as the board puts together other policies, like on budget creation, um, we're kind of looking back to the current <clears throat> um, the current uh, MPS uh, policies and, and there's a social overlay you know that sort of environmental purchasing overlay that is in that policy and I don't know whether um, does this would this allow for in the future say if we decided we wanted to amend this does that work to be able to lay over a 
you know, local purchasing or environmental purchasing or some other overlay? Because I see there's some, you know, it's pretty specific about what, at a minimum, you have to do. But I don't know whether you're allowed to lay over more on top of that. Um, it, it would get tricky because federal um, procurement would not allow for that. It federal procurement is cut and dry on what you have to do. Um, if we're lo using local funds, we probably could do that. Um, so it would have we would have to look into how to kind of separate that out within that section. You know, maybe there's a right. you know, subsection that it relates to federal funds right. versus state right. and local funds. Or where funding sources allow these shall be used or whatever. Correct. I see. So it, this, this, it looks like in the budget execution, that's where you would put something like that if, you, if we agreed we wanted to do it in the future. Yeah, okay. under the bids and purchasing. Right. We have had, I mean, that is in our policy. No. It's in the MPS policies, and the yeah. question is whether it rolls forward and where it would go if it rolls forward. Because we, we're, we're deconstructing the current policies in the new system, right. so this is part of that deconstruction. The language as it exists right now as our policy that relates to that, mm -hmm. uh, if we had a federal fiscal monitoring visit, we would be found in, in Not violation. out of compliance. Mm -hmm. yeah. <coughs> These are great. Does anyone, anyone else have any questions for Grant tonight? I guess the only thing, do you feel comfortable, I mean there's a lot of, a lot of specificity in here, do you feel comfortable that everything in here is that you want to be held to as policy rather than as guidelines? I'm comfortable with it the way it is um, because to me another added benefit of this is related to any kind of transition that might occur. And, you know, just not having to search through to find, oh, what do we have to do related to this topic or that topic? We can pull out two policies oh, and yeah. everything is in it's huge, yeah. So if there's personnel turnover, it's nice to have it all captured in one place. Um, if there's any kind of more detailed procedure, it's, um, I mean, there are some procedures, but it's more like the federal procurement forms that you have to fill out and the specific process you have to go um, go through. So I, my preference is to have it spelled out like this because I can just pull this off in one document and see basically from A to Z what's required. So not unnecessarily prescriptive? No, I mean if, if you're putting my whole world in a, into policy and it's only 11 pages, I think that's, that's pretty, that's pretty okay. good. Great. So. Um. In the budget execution policy under employee reimbursement, mm -hmm. um, is there language there that that would say that it has to be consistent with the with the negotiated agreements? And is are you confident that this is consistent with the, the negotiated agreement to, to the in, extent it has to be? And in which section was it under employee reimbursements? Under employee reimbursements reimbursement? for travel and professional development. Um, it should be because it, under professional development, it relates to um, the any kind of professional development approval forms. So by tying it to those approval forms, would make sure that we were always in compliance with whatever. Right. So to that point, the negotiated agreement only provides that. Now this is we're speaking about teachers. Uh, would only provide for course reimbursement. It's very specific as to what can be reimbursed. Travel is not reimbursable for. Um, teachers under the current negotiated agreement. So that would, as long as we are staying within the approval process that currently exists, the procedure that currently exists, um, this would, this is, has room enough and <coughs> would not violate um, our, the commitment we have through the negotiated agreement. So this, per, there are instances, if I'm understanding this, where the district does pay for travel and attendance, for professional development that's outside of what the as long as it's not As long as it, it is, we cannot do it for teachers. But for example, if, if a member of the leadership team were to go to a conference and there's a cost, a travel cost associated with it, that is reimbursable. But um, for a teacher to travel that is not a reimbursable cost under the negotiated agreement. We can only cover the cost of the tuition or the cost of the course. So teachers never travel for school business? If they do, it's, I mean, they may, um, 
they could do it as mileage, but if a teacher was flying to a conference, we would not reimburse them for the, tr the travel or the hotels associated with it. But so this says that we would if they were traveling for school business, so that, that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm trying to flag. Well, we reimburse so for reasonable expense, so things like the IRS uh, rate for mileage. So if somebody is, tomorrow I'm going to Roxbury, I can put in for vicinity travel. If a teacher did that, they could as well. Um, so so, for, so to, your, to your point, this would, we would still flag this anyway because as a teacher puts in for their professional development, only the principal and I would sign off if it's professional development covering the cost of the course. We would not sign off on, and we have returned forms that have included either lodging and or um, travel costs associated with it. And so we've asked people to resubmit only with the course cost included in it. But you understand my question is, do you think the policy here is capturing that intent? Because it says, you know, in this language about travel, or does it need a, does it need caveats around? To I the think thinking? that was the, the purpose for that last sentence, which is the reimbursement process is the same identified in paragraph two below. So if somebody does travel, for professional development, they would have to fill out the form. The form would then be spelling out and whether they right were allowed to be reimbursed for travel expenses, and it would not show that they could get travel expenses. Um, so I think the first part of this is that we there is situations where we will reimburse for travel, for vicinity travel, those kinds of things, but the process has to be spelled out um, as part of the professional development form. And on that, there would not be an authorization for travel expense. Any other questions or discussion about these? Thanks a lot, Grant. Thank you, um, Grant. So these will have to come up at another. We'll have, to, we'll have another meeting to vote yeah. on those. Um, and if if anyone has questions in the interim, I think feel free to send them to Jim, and Jim can pass them on <laughs> uh. <laughs> to Grant. To Grant. <laughs> okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, Ryan, do you want to turn to the transfer policy? So this one's short, so maybe for the audience I will read this one. Um, Students in the Montpelier Roxbury School District will attend grades K to 4 in the elementary school located in their town of residence. Provided, however, a parent request, the Board of School Directors may adjust student enrollment within the new district based on individual student circumstances and the superintendent's determination of capacity to serve the child. 
Pretty straightforward. Pretty straightforward. Any it's questions? Very in line with the articles of agreement that we voted totally. on in June last year. Yeah. Steve? I, I think it's great. I, I think that um, I'm concerned that the provided however is this gigantic loophole that it's basically saying, yeah, but we actually will. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, right? I mean, right. it seems like what we're saying is absolutely interdistrict, in district transfers are totally allowed for a reason, is really what the policy says. Right, and we could, I mean, it could, there are lots of ways you could do it, right? It could be for exceptional circumstances, it could be for extraordinary circumstances. It, well, you could raise the standard, you could leave it here. Will we have procedures? Will we have procedures? Yeah, that give the superintendent criteria, or? I think That's it would be missing. up to the superintendent, could probably develop them, but I mean, since we don't do this in MPS, yeah. It's well, also what we do, though, because people do, I mean, we've considered a couple of these in the last couple of years. Not this, though. This is really different. This is an intra-district. It's, it's inside the district, but still switching. I mean, would we be looking for a similar case to be made that it's, you know, the child's needs can't be met in one school and they must be met in the other school? Or do, is the, it, or right, is the bar this is not about IEP decisions. That right. that would be made by, by, the, IEP by the IEP team, team right. and not but, does not come to the board. Right, but it's so I think that either we need to come up with a word that indicates a standard, right, or we need to create an or we need to instruct the superintendent to create a, a standard. One of the two, because it, it seems like right now we're the standard is. Uh, to serve the child, capacity to serve the child, individual students, and the superintendent's determination of capacity to serve the child. Is that where we want to leave it? Maybe we do, but um, it means that this, the student's needs cannot be met, or it's not even that, that the school does not have the capacity to meet that child's needs or best educational interests <laughs> or best interests yeah I mean I don't I don't think it requires the superintendent to decide that the school can't serve the child right. needs I think it says better. you right Just better. it was better um, and it's also a may so it's not even saying that it's not saying the request has to be granted. It's just yeah. saying there's Even discretion there to grant it. It's broad discretion. Right. And yeah. they have to come to the board. It's up to the board. But it's based on a recommendation from the superintendent. Um, but it, it would be great to have a clearer, a, any kind of clearer standard than capacity to serve, I think, would be helpful in making those decisions. Are you thinking? Um, the kind of standard that would really be like these are the factors to consider or just sort of indicating how strong a showing you have to make that it would be exceptional circumstances or something which just clear language about under, not the specific circumstances but the um, I guess it, I'm just struggling with the, the phrase capacity to serve the child and what that might mean and you know, I, I might be satisfied if it was just, you know, the superintendent's determination um, that a particular school is in the best interest, in the child's best interest. Um, but, you know, it might, it's the hard. kinds of, well, I mean, I think at Ryan's point because, all along, I don't want to speak for him, but. Because of extraordinary circumstances yeah. or something. I mean, I think like one of the things that Ryan had mentioned to me that we we're struggling with is that we haven't gone through this yet, so it's mm -hmm. kind of hard to know. Mm -hmm. right. And for example, so one example that I would think of is that you, know, you might have a situation where it's more driven by the circumstances in Roxbury, like if you have only one fourth grader. Right. It wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be so much about the student as it might be, mm -hmm. maybe that's a situation where the parents and the district would say, would you rather, you know, mm -hmm. would you rather come to Montpelier for that year or mm -hmm. not? Well, or you could have, a, a or you could have a kid who's really just very unhappy there and has nothing mm -hmm. to do with this. You know, it, it's that's a whole different thing because our, do we want to a huge question? And maybe this is already decided in the merger process, and I'm not recalling. But 
if there is only one kid in fourth grade. Um, and of course, it's to the benefit of the district if that one fourth grader is located with all the other fourth graders and we don't have to provide fourth grade for the benefit of one kid, can the district make the decision to move that kid regardless of the interest of the parents and the child? Well, you know. I mean, that's not addressed in this. Right. Well, and also, I mean, presumably in the ordinary course, the administration is looking at enrollment and how it's happening and could be flagging these things well right. in advance right. <laughs> right. Right. of it having you made so that the new board could be mm -hmm. considering them. You know, mm -hmm. We're moving any grade but from one building to another is just a board decision, right? How do you do that? Like when fifth grade moves to the middle school, what did we? How was that decision made? Because that's all that would be moving the fourth grade to Union or whatever would just be a, a decision. Yeah, but but it would, you know, contravene this policy unless the, the new board changed it. Okay. Well, as it's written, I think it would. Right. The, the question is, does should this policy <coughs> address that? in addition to addressing a situation driven by a child. I think or, yeah, I'm I've, I'm I've actually, I actually have already had a Roxbury parent say, can't my kid go to school at a particular school because it's closer to where I work? Yes. Mm -hmm. And that will be very common. That will be very common. That may be a common request, but really? It's not a convenience-driven education system. I mean, a lot of our parents work in Burlington or Waterbury, and the kids go here. So I don't see that as a justification to move them, personally. But I know there may be people who do see it that way. Um, so I, I just think it would be good to be. Can, maybe we start, the first part of that problem is, what if, it, the, what if the, the school's needs are to move children out? I think we should maybe put a, a caveat in here that this does not apply to, to a situation where the district's needs or the district's, you know, just sort of, sort of like pull that out of the puzzle and put it back where it is today, which is there's no policy on it. The board just decides. So rule that out as one of the reasons. But then otherwise, it's, we're really talking about the student's educational needs, not the extraordinary needs of the family. So the extraordinary needs of a family, we're saying, or at least Michelle, I think I'm hearing, would not be the reason we would do this. It would be the extra, it would be the extraordinary needs of the child's education. And I don't know if extraordinary is the word you want, but can I speak to I, I would I would <coughs> lean towards a more some sense that there's more clear definitions, especially in the early stages. Mm -hmm simply because I think we're all doing this in good faith to try to make this work. And the more clarity that the board could provide for me around making it about educational needs, I think would be able to head off very easily potential convenience conversations. Um, because I think, as I would say that as it's written now, it does seem that the caveat is relatively wide and, and people could potentially spend some time with the board trying to um, trying to haggle over individual student circumstances that might not be in the best interest of the first, the early stages of this merger, which I think for me, trying to look forward is to really hope that we are able to sustain a really good enrollment at Roxbury and I wouldn't want I think something firmer that would give both the superintendent and the board the opportunity to make it more about educational um, standards, I think would be um, personally, professionally um, better. Ryan, did you have any? Yes, yeah, so I was thinking about the conversation. I don't think we discussed too much the idea of the district making the decisions to move students around. We had talked about the scenario when you do have that maybe one student in one grade in Roxbury. But you know, thinking about our class size policy, like mm -hmm. there might be a scenario in the future that, mm -hmm. say, the third grade class in Union Elementary is pretty big. It's up, it might be exceeding the upper limits on the class size policy. Would the district have the ability to say, well, you know what, there's actually room 
and the class size policy enrollment for third grade in the Roxbury Village School, maybe it makes sense for us to try to encourage and try to push some UES students to RBS for that third grade class. Um, I, don't think, I don't think we really considered how the district as a whole, or the administration might be thinking about moving students around or how the administration might be potentially considering transferring students. That's why that needs to be explicitly kind of taken out of this policy, I think, is to, is to just state that, you know, that, I mean, the other piece is how does it fall, and let's say that a, a student's extraordinary educational needs sort of justify a move, but if we bring one more kid in, we're going to have a problem. Can we, can that be a factor to say, you know what, this year we're going to say no because it's just going to be a huge problem, but next year it wouldn't be a huge problem, so give it a year. You know, I mean, does that, or is that then violating the, the, faith, the good faith of this, which is, no, no, we're putting the kid first, and if it doesn't meet that threshold, then, you know, the threshold's high enough that that, 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 that district need will always be um, subordinated. You know how high is this? How high is this threshold? It seems like it, you would want that, right? The threshold which should be high enough that the district will always be subordinated to that somehow. The so, capacity to serve phrase almost makes it sound yeah. like, well, if we've got room for them. Yeah. But that's so, not necessarily what we're trying to say. I guess I, I I have to say I have some concern about drafting it in a way that suggests that there would be a test based on how well we think a school is serving a child. I mean, I, th that the child's educational needs are being met, because this is not, again, this is not about IEPs. Right. That's handled by the IEP team. Mm -hmm. right. True. So, and both schools should be serving the children. All children who live <laughs> All there. All children who live there. And, you know, I, I don't think we want to set this policy up to be something where parents are coming in saying, we'd like, we think this other school right. is a better school. And if they don't, we yeah. shouldn't. We should go just fix that problem. You're right. It's a great yeah. point because I was sitting here thinking to myself, how likely is it that there's going to be an extraordinary circumstance that's not special ed driven? Right. Well, like, there could be a, be a you know, it's a, medical. There could it's not. That's not. Or social. Right. I mean, there are. There are yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. So I'm sorry. There de I could definitely foresee a social situation. Mm -hmm. um, what would people think of of a second sentence that was something like? Um, the board will, will only grant exceptions to this policy in exceptional circumstances. Or exceptions you know, are That exceptions. just makes it high. Right. It make, makes it clear that it's a high be, standard, but. They'll make exceptions for exceptional circumstances? Oh, well, for it's extraordinary. better. <laughs> it's got to have to be a high, like extraordinary or something. Like, it has to right, be very like rare. extraordinary circumstances. It's just, sure. I don't know. I'm just trying to throw out. That That's definitely better. But then we're talking about, as you're kind of refining here, you're talking about social or health reasons, not that, that would in some way be improve their education by being here, like closer to a hospital, or not that they're that much closer to a hospital, but you know. Or if they're the only girl in, Ro in their grade in Roxbury, <coughs> then they need more peers. Possibly. Or they're. You would think a bullying problem could be solved, but they can't. It must be. Always. Yeah. We, uh, we have a statutory responsibility to fix that one. Um, but maybe we fix it by moving the kid. I don't, I don't know. I don't think we want to go down there. Right? So, yeah. Any other did other on? Did other policies that you looked at make um, References to either the district approach, the district making a decision, or parents approaching the board. Were there other policies that broke it out in that way? Right? So it was a little bit tricky to compare our situation to a lot of the districts' sure, policies sure. that I look at. Simply because the other districts that we had comparable policies to examine were much larger. Sure. You know, they had like, between like three and five schools mm -hmm. for elementary alone. Mm -hmm. The um, communities might have been more consistent in terms of population. Sure. Um, yeah. We were actually the only policy that negated the opportunity for interdistic mm -hmm. um, choice. Oh. So in a like place like Burlington, like they're going to look at it differently. Because it was right. really tough to compare sure. our district with some of those other ones. Yeah. Because sure. we have two okay. schools that are fairly distinct. Um, did you, did you get a sense of what hmm. basis they would have for moving, like among the schools, in, say, in Burlington? 
And so, uh, is it just pandemonium up there? So it was Mills, so I remember there's Mills River, Harwood Union, and so it's not, the decision to move between the schools, and it was primarily elementary school because most of the districts had a union high school and middle school. It wasn't something that was just, maybe we'll give it a try this year and just see how it goes. If you committed to transfer, you essentially perform the rest of your academic career as an elementary student in that other school. Um, so it wasn't something so like you would- you could make like a one-time permanent transfer. Yes, mm -hmm. right. It wasn't something that you would do every other year, kind of depending on what was happening. If you chose to switch to elementary school A to B, then you were in B for the rest of your elementary school education. Um, but no sense of the basis for? So it was, it had to be initiated by parents. Um, it hmm. came back to administration and board approval. And I'm trying to remember if there was almost like a one for one ratio to make sure that there wasn't gonna be a big transfer of students from one school to the other. I don't recollect, I don't recollect there being that one for one Stipulation. See, I wonder if that's the better way to handle this is just to say no unless there's a one for one. Mm -hmm. And just be, uh, just no unless there's a one for one. When is that ever going Exactly. <laughs> so the idea is, and that makes a clear statement that what our objective here is to keep the populations stable. Because um, that's really the, really the only thing we're concerned about. We don't, we, other than that, we're, we're happy to do anything. I mean, unless we have some social, like community-based concerns about, no, we want our kids to all be educated in the same place, right. which is a reasonable objective. But um, I mean, really our concern is sort of like, let's not drain off kids to the bigger center. Well, the way you do that is you say no, unless you can find someone to swap with, a one-to-one. -one. And then we don't really have any problem with it. Do you think would fall back to the parents to find the one for one? No, no, but, but the district becomes it'd be a list. Over. Like here's seven people that want this and there's no one on the other side or whatever. I, I, you know, I'm not saying that's a perfect solution, but it's, it's pretty transparent what we're trying to achieve and we're not leaving it to some cloudy standard. I mean, I think the most important thing about having this policy adopted soon is just that, that yeah. we're transparent to everyone in the communities about how mm -hmm. this is going to work and so mm -hmm. that parents aren't emailing saying, can mm -hmm. I switch my kid or, you know, mm -hmm. that we can say, no, there's a policy, this is the way the policy is going to work. I and I don't think we're trying to predict what's going to happen in two or three years right. because yeah. that's, yeah. it's a learning that's experience right. and we yeah. know that. No, that's fair. I'm, I'm inclined to go with Bridget's suggestion to change the second sentence to refer to um, extraordinary circumstances. That would work. Recommendation. You know, the, the board can it can. The board will grant exceptions only based on ex extraordinary circumstances. Yeah. And it still gives you enough legal leeway to make a determination based on individual circumstances. Yeah, it's extraordinary circumstances which impact students' educations, right? Mm -hmm. Right, not yeah. the family extraordinary mm -hmm. circumstance. Right, students' education. Education, right. I, or educational experience. Or do you think? I would just leave it. But I, you know, it's a, whatever people mm -hmm. think. But. It, Again, I, I, first of all, I think it could, I mean, it's it could be it. an issue that's not exactly educational, like the issue of health. I hadn't thought of that. And that, that mm -hmm. I mean, it's a tie there, but it would really be, it's because this family has made a compelling case that there's a medical reason that their child would be better off placed in a Montpelier school. Mm -hmm. But even that would be to improve their educational opportunities because they would be better able to stay in school kind of thing. Right, but it's sort of more, it, it's more gray area. I feel like if you say it relevant to education or relevant, mm -hmm. to, you're, you're inviting people to say, I see what you're saying. you know, yes, I do. the yeah. issue is that I think mm -hmm. there's more educational yeah. opportunity in one school mm -hmm. or the right. other. That's a judgment right. call. We don't Which is really a difficult mm -hmm. thing to right. Or I just assess. don't like that teacher. So I don't know. Not necessarily. I mean, there, you know, not in all situations. In some it is. Um, but you know there are there are you know I could think about if a if a student had a, a seizure tendency that might not manifest itself as part of a disability that's impacting them to the third gate which is adverse effect but might need access to a nurse five days a week 
which currently Roxbury doesn't have. You know, and so like under that circumstance, I would mm -hmm. come to the board and say, this is to me a very compelling case sure. of a, a non-IEP, but still educationally related situation where it's in this child's best interest to be in a building with a nurse that's staffed there five days a week. Yeah. Something to that, but that it's still very rare. I mean, you know, that's but one. But how do you, in, under that same standard, how do you say, I'm sorry, the, mm -hmm. You know your your work schedule and your the in the extraordinary inconvenience you have around the cars in your family doesn't qualify. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you have enough to do that? In other words, do you have enough to make that call and to? Because I think that's a much more likely um, application you're going to receive. Yeah, I agree. And probably get two or three of them every year. So just as long as we feel good about the language, it's, it's going to kind of make that clear to, to parents so they feel like, I'm not even going to bother, or I get it. I'm not, this isn't an arbitrary standard. I'm not being treated to an arbitrary mm -hmm. decision here. Just, that's all, just be yeah, careful. Yeah, no, I know. It's, it's a tough one. Did, and we may have to change it. Mm -hmm. Did Roxbury have anything like this with Northfield? I know it wasn't the same district, but... So there have been students in the past who, for medical reasons, like the scenario Brian's talking about, were actually served better in Northfield than Roxbury. I don't remember, I mean, Lori's sitting in the audience and can probably give you the details on whether or not that was an IEP decision or if it was just a medical reason, mm -hmm. but there have been instances where, yes, there have been Roxbury students who've been placed in Northfield for whatever the extraordinary circumstances might have been. So the so that would have been a different different enough that it's hard to compare yeah mm -hmm. do you feel like you have enough to come back with a different well, draft even with a couple of right. I mean, it comes options. With the definition for the criteria for what extraordinary circumstances mm -hmm. is and then yeah so it's adding that extra sentence and getting clarification there or maybe deciding whether or not, like Stephen mentioned, it would make sense to include the one-for-one -one language as yeah. well. Um, but yeah, definitely student-driven, not family convenience. Seems like the board's generally in consensus in terms of the direction of the policy. It's just the language itself to get worked out. Okay. Thanks. So, this is hard. This is really this is a really hard Thank one. You. Thank you for taking it on, and we will come back. <laughs> So substitute teachers? Sure. Um, so the, the only recommendation uh, Lori and I would want you to consider, um, and this comes specifically from the current MPS policy, sorry, yeah, MPS policy, um, where it says unlicensed persons and licensed educators, that number right now is set at 15 in MPS. Um, and that was a procedure that I inherited that was formerly a policy but became a procedure when we went to policy governance. So essentially the standard is set higher for non-licensed and licensed but in the wrong subject area currently okay. in MPS. Um, candidly, it turns into a little bit of a paperwork type situation where we have to very quickly recognize that a long-term sub is needed and can only, um, through the current procedures, serve for three consecutive school weeks. It's not impossible. Um, I think the intent was a good one when it was written. I would say practically speaking, though, if we're looking for a long-term sub, this is a safer um, scenario. We do ultimately end up getting the provisional license um, in these circumstances and these circumstances are rare. So, um, in fact, I can think of not one time this year that we've had to go this route, but I do know it, depending on um, certain educators' life circumstances and situations, there have been years where, candidly, Heather has been scrambling with me and the Agency of Education trying to get an appropriate provisional license. So, um, and also very candidly, substitute teachers are, are a perennial problem mm -hmm. in Washington County. Mm -hmm. um, there are a lot of schools that are jockeying for a lot of educators. Um, 
uh, you know, so it's on, on a decent day, we may have a lack of coverage in some of our buildings and some study halls and some double coverage. And so um, I don't have a strong feeling either way. I w did want to just make sure that I pointed out that the current MPS procedure has both of those numbers at 15 days. Um, um, but this this is the, recom uh, the, this is the, the recommended, recommended mandatory, mandatory policy, policy from the VSBA. So, so this is legal to do 30? Correct. Okay. Correct. You could go strong. As with anything that comes from the VSBA, you can always go stronger, um, but you can't go the other direction. So you couldn't, you couldn't say 45 or 60. Yeah. Right. Um, you could be more stri stringent, um, which is a consideration. Um, and I, I get the spirit of that. Um, at the same time, when we do advertise for a long-term sub, we typically get better candidates. And it's, right. m for the most part, a situation that we're usually able to fill. It sometimes comes at a cost, because typically those people are also our daily subs. So it goes to the overall question of substitute teachers and the availability of in Washington County, with a lot of schools, with people who have life circumstances and take days off here and there, and then you have a long-term need as well. So. Lori, do you want to add anything to that? Any questions or discussion on? No? Okay. Any questions or discussion from the board on this? So you're recommending 30. Is that I, I, you're, I am, that's how you draft yeah, it. I am recommending okay. 30. I just did want to bring to the board's attention it's currently 15 in MPS. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, think, I think 30 is a reasonable amount of time. Right. That's what I, right. That's what I told them. It's, I mean, right. So I mean, we'll still be going if they're not, we'll still be going for the provisional or the emergency. It's just a question of how quickly we have to actually obtain it. Okay. All right, hearing no further discussion, we'll move on from that, which will be warned again for adoption mm -hmm. at our next meeting. Volunteers and work study students. Um, this is a mandatory policy, and it's currently word for word the one that we have both here in MPS, and I'm fairly certain it's also in Washington, South, and Roxbury, right, Lori? This is one that we both had as is. Um, you know, the most important part for me is not necessarily the definition, but um, the policy, and that's that we are screening people who are coming into contact with our students, and this meets exactly the procedures that we use, sometimes to the frustration of the people who are trying to serve. Um, at the same time, it's something we take incredibly seriously. Those of you on the MPS board and probably Ryan would recall some of last year's conversations with Act 166 and our private partners in terms of the licensing and background checks um, against registries. That's really, for me, that's the most compelling part of this, of this policy. Um, What's the level of volunteerism that triggers getting screened? We, we go right yeah. for it. Unfettered, unfettered access to, to students is... I've never been screened. Yeah, I've never been screened. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfettered. Un but yeah, no that's what I was asking. Alone yeah. with oh. a child without someone who has been screened and is not on any of our registry lists. So that, was in the, a, that was sort of what I was getting at. Right. So, so if, if you're going to be the so sole... Alone, so if you are alone bedroom. with a child without someone who already has had a background check, in the room, visible to you and that individual, you would have to have you would have to have a background check um, in order for that to take place. So, if you're the parent that's reading to students in the back of the classroom and the teacher is there, correct. do not correct. That's correct because that teacher would have been background checked. Understood. I have one small request, which Please. is to change the superintendent shall to will. We're, we're trying. To, sure, absolutely. We're trying to be consistent. Sure. No, thank you will. for catching. Mm -hmm. And I'll yeah. try. Yeah. And there's, and then the screening process will. We'll we'll go all the child to will and all. Yeah. Thank you for catching that. Any questions or discussion about this one? All right. Thank you. So for can those. I warn? As long as we make those changes from child to will, we'll also warn um, the volunteer work study students to be adopted at the next meeting as well. Yeah. Everyone's good with that. Okay. okay. Thank Great. you. I'm seeing tired people around the table. They are tired. Uh, yes. I'm going to skip to class size. And
All right, well, I'm just going to say that I just have a strong sense, given the time and how tired people are, that we should not talk about the code of conduct, and we should just talk about that a, at the retreat. We sure. need a thorough discussion of that. I'm, I'm seeing people that look like we've had a long yeah. night. And it's I think a pretty big topic. But if others right. feel strongly, I, I'll do it. No, there. I think it needs discussion, so let's not do it tonight. <laughs> okay. Regardless. Um, we'll move that to the retreat. The class size policy is on the second reading. Can you go over the changes that were made to it? Yes. So, um, Lori and I, let me just pull that document up, sorry. Lori and I came up with um, a way that we think will honor the spirit of this policy and capture the practical nature of how it operates at the Roxbury Village School. And Lori, I'm going to say, why don't you just come on up in case I botch this. We're going to try to do it because of the unique nature of the Roxbury School and in an effort to truly support that school going forward as a um, well-enrolled educational institution. We are recommending that the board consider a cutout for Roxbury by classroom and not necessarily by a grade cluster. Because as it's current, Lori and I went back and forth on this for, for a long time to try to get it to fit Mm -hmm. kind of the UES grade clusters and we were each coming up with all kinds of scenarios where it was like oh that'll work but wait because then it's a cluster mm -hmm. and it wasn't until probably an hour and a half into it that one of us said what if we did it by classrooms so the idea is it would read Roxbury multi-grade K4 as it does in that first column minimum average number of students per classroom would be eight Optimum average would be 10 to 12, and the maximum average, and we went big here, would be less than 40. We, we think we're okay there, but, but we did a lot of different calculations, and this really gives us a lot of rooms, a lot of, not room, room within a two classroom system. And then the caveat here is that no teacher would have more than two grade levels per classroom. So given actually everything that everybody was talking about before, this would cover a lot of fluctuation, possibly, based on enrollment being one, or in some cases, zero. It would still give the principal and the leadership team the flexibility to adjust the number of grade levels in a single classroom, but it would also give the board the flexibility to say that it's within the policy, given a lot of different potential permutations of fluctuations, either up or down at Roxbury. So this Roxbury would essentially have its own cutout, but it would be in an effort for the board to honestly support the, the makeup of the building now and how we could potentially see it going forward. How did, did I capture that? <laughs> okay. All right. So I get it. Do the, how is this relative to sort of the SOP, the standing operating procedure of how things have been there in terms of no more than two grades for a teacher and up to 40 in a classroom. Well, 40 in a classroom hasn't been an issue yet. No. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that would require. Right, and I'm trying to think, off the top of my head, I don't recall our existing class size policy, but it hasn't been something that's been relevant to Roxbury's discussions about education. The, the operating procedure in the past had really been, it was up to the administration team, the superintendent, the principal, and the teachers to sit down, look at enrollment, Next year, we're going to have classes clustered like this because that makes the most sense based on the number of students. Um, so this isn't that different than how we've been operating in the past. It just has some numbers to go along with it, really. But if you had three grades with very small numbers in them, right, and you might be tempted to put all three of those grades with one teacher, you might have five, three, and six or something, right? <coughs> um, you really can't do that under this policy, which may be very healthy. But I'm just saying that it does limit you in that way. I like that limitation. I think from a teacher's perspective, that probably gives some sanity. But um, I don't know if it's consistent with what's been going on. So we did that for the teacher sanity yeah. because we didn't think that it would really be reasonable to have a teacher approach. If you think about the fact that within all grade level currently, let's take third grade at Union Elementary School, the variation in student abilities within that one grade is incredibly wide. Multiply that by three, or two, you know, to, to have a total of three. 
that's a really difficult expectation for a teacher. But it also, if we did it by classroom and limited the classrooms to two, it gave the board the most flexibility within just that parameter. That's not to say that you couldn't have standalones. You couldn't have a single K, because you could. It just says no more than two grades per classroom. So you could be flexible and nimble to meet any fluctuation in enrollment that the board would hopefully see coming based on you know, uh, predictions coming from the team. Um, but it also would keep at least relatively close to the model that's happening in MPS, and so it wouldn't be that different. The only difference is, is that it's by classroom and not by cluster. But you might have a teacher who has just worst case scenario, yep. kindergartners and fourth graders, and has 38 kids in the class, one teacher. So ideally, we wouldn't go that route. I mean, you know, we would try to keep the level of sanity and say if we had to combine it, we would do a K standalone and a 3 4 together. You know, like that disparity in a classroom would really not be educationally wise. I think we're trying to, because the clusters were K 2, what was tripping Lori and me up was the clusters were K 2 and 3 4. Mm -hmm. So we kept trying to look at different clusters. K2 and 3-4 at the Roxbury Village School and come up with all the possible permutations to get in here. And the only way, so we were approaching it from that lens, so I'm telling you the thinking is you would have a K1 potentially, or a one, two, you know, you would have two consecutive grade levels as clustered in a classroom. Are you okay with having your hands tied to the word consecutive? Yeah, I think so. I think that's really the only reasonable way to go forward. I, because to your point, I wouldn't want a teacher teaching a K four, a K, a, a classroom with K and a classroom with four, mm -hmm. to fit within the the letter of the law for this policy. So it doesn't explicitly say the classroom consecutive. have consecutive grades right. in them, but it's assumed. Oh, no, I, it's add, I, I think that's a good point. This discussion means that we should put the consecutive the teachers. Yes. I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah. That. Yes. Agreed. Mm -hmm. That's what we, you're yeah, right. Because we were thinking it off of the clusters that were currently written for, yeah. So we'll do that. It's very creative. I like it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going to add classrooms, consecutives. <clears throat> and then you're going to just modify. We're going to put that in. This, we're, yes. So that this, because this K to 8 will now have to say for Montpelier or mm -hmm. something like that. You'll mm -hmm. figure out. We'll way figure to do out that. a way to put that in. Yep, absolutely. answered a question I had about definitions, a classroom, and the grade clustering. I'm curious, Bridget, was it on purpose that the K-8 class size table is labeled as guidelines, whereas the 9 through 12 is labeled as parameters? <laughs> Consistency. Very good catch. Yeah. <laughs> There's really no reason that those should be different, right? I wonder if they're different in the current policy. I have no idea. They don't, plain English, they don't have any different meaning, really. Sarah. No, I would say change them both to guidelines. Because mm -hmm. why not use an easier word when mm -hmm. you can? <laughs> Thanks. Anything else? Oh, no. Class size policy? Great. So we're not going to adopt that tonight. Um, but is, is it okay to have this? On the next agenda with these changes to be Adopt. warned for adoption. Oh, great. You bet. Right. Didn't, great. Didn't last meeting we had a discussion about on the high school page, this section on requests for new courses, student schedules, et cetera. Actually, I think the student schedule thing may have been added in the interim because I don't remember that from before. We definitely had a discussion. There was no policy. consensus to take it out. There was a discussion about taking it out. Okay. Uh, but we didn't decide to take it out. I did not think that we had that there was a consensus that we should take it out. But if we want to revisit that, this is the time to do it. Um, I I come back to the fact that the principal asked for it and said it was important to have it there. And okay. And I don't have any other place to put it. No, I think that I, I think so. Belongs here. But all right, all right. Um, 
All right, so that will be the end of the policy work for tonight. We will have the retreat next week. Um, what is this under temperature? Well, that is the next thing on the agenda. Let's discuss the board retreat. I think the um, I think I should have asked Jim what he thought. But, <laughs> um, but um, from prior discussions, uh, I definitely the it's it's about the board policies. It's about um, the kinds of policies that we're on. You know, just for some consideration tonight around uh, conflicts of interest and code of conduct, definitely, but also the what are currently in our policy as the um, board superintendent relationship and board governance policies. I, th I think it's about getting some really serious sit down around the table time to figure out where we're going on those. So folks should bring their policy manuals okay. with the current policies. Um, there were a number of attachments that were sent around at our last meeting when we talked about governance generally some of the VSBA policies I would definitely encourage people to bring those to um, because those are some other models that are out there for how you could put these policies in place and read the ones that, that are here tonight um, and so I think what we're going to try to do is oh I and the other thing that we need to talk about is <clears throat> are we going to have some kind of a strategic planning process or mm -hmm. public engagement process around the ends. So I think those are the, those, this is my best recollection that those are the two big topics. It's like direction on those, that big category of sort of governance policies and the ends policies. We're definitely not adopting any ends policies at the retreat, but, but I think we wanted to have a conversation about how we're going to get to the where, point. Where do ends policies come from? <laughs> That's a great way to phrase it, yeah. Um, so, so we have, I think the Montpelier board in the past has been much more formal in your retreats and you've had a moderator. Sometimes, Are we, not always. I think I remember hearing Steve Dale's name kicked around at some point after one of our meetings. Mm -hmm. Do we have a moderator assigned for this retreat Steve next Dale. week? Do Do we have it is Steve. It is yes, Steve, yeah. Steve Dale. Whatever. Hello. Keep us on track. We do not have a location yet. We do have a time. It's 9 to 1. But uh, Jim and I have not secured. We've not got a location yet. Should probably work on that. Oh, because it's during school. Yeah. Usually we have it yeah, in the summer right. and there's nobody here. We can't use. Hmm. We don't How many people is it total? This group this plus group? Jim plus Steve plus me plus Lori. I think my office is a little too small for that. We'll, we'll check up in the agency um, and see if we have a conference room. I doubt it, though. I okay. Is there anything else you think we need to talk it's about? It's a warm, can can I, warm meeting, so, it, yep. so it is open to public. observers from... Yeah. Yes, yeah. there will be no public comment section, but people yeah. can come and observe. Um, I just want to review my notes so that I can organize us for our next meeting. Uh, to confirm, we are pulling the grade advancement policy from our list since it's no longer mandated and we've, the board just tonight, adopted the proficiency-based graduation requirements. We'll be reading the in-district elementary school transfer policy for the second time the next meeting. Budget execution, fiscal management, substitute teachers, volunteer and work-study students with the edits around shall to will and the changes um, that we just discussed in terms of the class size policy. All, one, two, three, four, five of those will be warned for adoption at the 4-4 meeting, which is our next meeting. Is that? That's the four. Say that, say that again? I thought there were four that will be more. I've got budget execution, mm -hmm. fiscal management, mm -hmm. substitute teachers, Volunteer and work study students and class size policy. Oh, class size. Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's good. Yes. Second reading for in district and elementary school transfer policy. Um, do you how do you, do you want me to deal with the the board ones? We'll discuss like those. Just keep them as they're they're not. I mean, they were not ready to be warned, so they're just they're going to be on for the retreat for discussion. Okay. But I, they're not. I mean, we can keep they can keep, them. Right, we can keep right, reading right, them, right, I guess, right, if you right. want to say that. The, but, the, um, the, yeah, it doesn't hurt. Okay. 
Okay. I'm good. Okay. Motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Second. All right. All those in favor of adjourning? Aye. Aye.